rest and what would be a way of celebrating other aspects of living beings beyond humanity. Complete. This is Jim. <clears throat> Coming from that perspective, uh, it's awesome the number of people I see around here walking, jogging, mm. uh, hiking up into the mountains, uh, <clears throat> gardening. Uh, so, so, but this is crazy, but putting out Christmas lights. Uh, that, uh, uh, that is a, uh, <clears throat> is a, I think, responding to this dimensional life. Mm. Um, I think, I, uh, I, I, in our family, we sort of sit down for meals, and I think there was conversation about the importance of sitting down for meals, but I think in many younger families, they are so caught up in doing this, doing that, and doing the next thing that it's very, that that dimension, you know, of sitting down and saying grace or something like that as a moment of rest is, uh, is very difficult to do, though I think the urge for that is somewhat emerging, but I think it ends up being those of us who are older without so many responsibilities, we get to do it more often. And I'm complete. This is David. Uh, maybe I'm skipping to a, a different section, but uh, in the, in the uh, section on, I believe it's social love, uh, and in paragraph 232, he refers to uh, a new story. Now, Thomas Berry, uh, in his books, talks about the fact that we need a new story. Uh, and where he refers to this, in, the Pope refers to it in 232, he says, the actions that we do in the community uh, cultivate a shared identity with a story which can be remembered and handed on. In this way, the world and the quality of life of the poorest are cared for, with a sense of solidarity, which is at the same time aware that we live in a common home which God has entrusted to us. These community actions, when they express self-giving love, can also become intense spiritual experiences. And I think what he's calling for is that we've got to tell ourselves a new story, much the same way as Thomas Berry was, would talk about it. I'm complete. At this point, we want to move on to the next part of our format, which is to look at the whole chapter, and Alan will take 10 minutes and lead us in that. So it's a continuation of this dialogue, but we're going to look at the whole chapter now. Over to you, Ellen. Well, for you, as, as you've rested, quote unquote, within this study, is, are there insights that have emerged and that you would take away as part of your new story? Well, for me, one thing that definitely has come as a result of seeing this book and also this chapter, uh, I'm so glad that the leader of one particular faith has put this on the table, you know, as the main issue. And, uh, you know, given the fact that he's the head of such a huge portion of the population, I mean, that, that just makes me so excited, even though I'm not a Roman Catholic, because I, I can see the possibilities in other locations too, as well as within the Roman Catholic Church, which of course has, has its effect on the rest of the world as well. And, uh, you know, just the fact that you can have a book on this issue and 
the idea of having people actually studying all this in the context of faith and religion. Uh, yeah, that's that's exciting for me. And uh, whether it would be, you know, you could hope for things like this to happen within the other faiths. Because I think, uh, uh, you know, okay, there is, there is grassroots actions, but you also need this, this uh, actions at the macro level. And it's not the leaders of the nations who are going to be able to do it because they are so stuck in all the limits that that national boundaries put on them. But when you look at the whole area of faith or of ideas, you know, movements that people belong to those trusts, national borders, and uh, yeah, that's one of the things I'm excited by in reading this book in this chapter as well. I'm complete. Whose internet connection is lousy? Uh, <laughs> ours. <laughs> is frozen it says here oftentimes i i i think jim when i'm in arkansas i'm right in the middle of dog patch i don't know if everybody understands what dog patch is but we're up in the hills ellen you want to say that question again well, as you've, as you've rested, quote unquote, within this study and with colleagues, if this, is, if this could be one form of contemplative rest, what has emerged for you as you look back on this chapter or even on the whole book? What, what is coming to the surface for you? I'm not sure if this is because I'm trying to retire or not, but the conversation we had, I think, didn't we have a, some little conversation earlier about, oh yeah, Evelyn was talking about some woman she'd worked with who couldn't be neutral because she yeah. had a position. Yeah. I somehow think the notion of being a professional or doing stuff as a job, I don't think he really addresses. And I think there's a sense of, neutrality, where I may be very conscientious uh, as an individual in my home, but we don't really have the conversation in our organization that, uh, that is related to rest and contemplation and stuff like that. In my home, but when it comes to the complexities of uh, state politics and all the organizational it doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like it quite transfers. Mm. That's a thing I'm a little bit. I'm a little bit wondering about. Uh, <clears throat> I do think. I I feel like. Uh, what he's what he's describing here sounds to me very familiar with the insight of that the. Uh, in our old language, the other world is breaking in again. Mm. In our time, I, I, I think there are I, I think there are many people. I'm picking on chickens because I've got chooks. I've got four myself, uh, <clears throat> and we didn't. You know, we never. There wasn't the land of mystery, the river of consciousness, and the Koopa chickens. We didn't have that in the other world, but. Uh, when the trees turn golden in the neighbor's yard, I just stand and look at them. It affects me. It clearly affects me. Uh, it was a remarkable uh, the couple of times I was outside at sunrise or sunset 
during this workshop, the number of people who just stopped, they said, wait a minute, look at the sky. I do think there is something uh, rising in people uh, that would be related to what David said about Thomas Berry's new story, but how to how to nurture that when you're not semi-retired like I am, when you're you know and you're busy with family and children and community is not clear to me. But I am complete. What it's got me thinking about is the uh, this chapter and the whole book is how to raise these conversations interdisciplinarily that um, and, and, and into religiously like not just um, yeah how to have the depth of these conversations with people um, who aren't just speak in the same language as uh, I am we are um, it's been easy to have this conversation it's been great to have this conversation, this book study within the ICA. We're uh, people of similar minds. And so, yeah, I'm challenged with how am I going to take this conversation out? And it's been great, great having this over Christmas because we've had lots of family around at Christmas. So I have raised the conversation with them. But I'm challenged to think, well, how else am I going to raise this conversation? How am I going to do that? Okay. I was just thinking that, um, uh, you know, when Francis addresses people in this book, he's got various uh, ways of talking about them. One is consumers. Mm -hmm. The other is uh, family. The other is ob obviously uh, members of the Roman Catholic Church. And in the first one, consumers, he's got that whole thing on being a moral consumer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, there he does come up with, and which is actually the first part anyway, there he does actually come out about what, how we can do things, you know. In he talks about how to use uh, our power as consumers to put pressure on this. And actually, when you think of it, I mean, as uh, consumers, we play a big economic role, and that seems to be the only role we are. You know, people are kind of limited to, but they do spend so much time in supermarkets and all of that. And if this priority of caring for the earth came in that into that dimension of life, uh, what that could do to the suppliers and then you know and and so on, uh, that is definitely uh, one area where everyone could be involved in. Uh, yeah, I'm complete. Well, isn't that actually? <clears throat> well advanced I I mean uh, <clears throat> uh, I see signs uh, farmer in the <clears throat> in the United States currently farmers markets are the most rapidly growing form of enterprise uh, in the country hmm. uh, so I think, I mean, I, I feel like <clears throat> some of this, it, it, the way he words it, it sounds like we're just starting on this, but th th I think there's a lot going on. There's, you know, the whole uh, kerfuffle around wood. I think you mentioned that earlier in one of the conversations about one of the chief ministers selling off the forest, but there's been a lot in terms of... Uh, cutting down on, I don't know what's the right word, but knowing the origin of, of lumber and being able to not, being able to decide about it, uh, where it comes from and trying to cut back on that sort of thing. Uh, local food. Right. I'm not saying the consumer thing is is still there. There's an interesting movement. Uh, if you want to look for, look up on the internet, the story of stuff mm -hmm. that is very graphic and simple and quite powerful. Uh, 
images related to this notion of being a, we've got an economy that produces stuff and the stuff produces waste and we haven't figured out what to do with the waste. We still generate more stuff. Mm. Very nice series that kind of lays this out in cartoon form. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it's, that's, that's right what you're saying. But the thing is when, um, you know, in my part of the world, you feel like you are just part of that minuscule elite that is aware of these things. And generally, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not prevalent, you know. And when I think of uh, even if uh, just a few of these things could become, uh, uh, you know, everybody got involved, that would definitely make a huge impact. I mean, when I think of things like, you know, Malaysia is currently talking about signing this uh, uh, agreement with, uh, with the U.S., you know, the TPPA, which would be terrible because we would, it will put, uh, you know, Malaysian law under the control of multinationals, you know, and they're going, they're going to be talking about supplying products that, and, you know, you wouldn't have a way of, you know, and these kind of things go on because the masses of people are just meek and mild when it comes to how they buy things, you know, uh, you know, at the supermarket, it's only a very small number who are the articulate activists. But if this, if just that were to become massive, can you imagine the whack it would give the whole economy? I mean, that would, I mean, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's not new, but uh, it's nowhere at the power and force it should be. I mean, that's, that's my idea. Breaking a gate, but I, I'm the timekeeper here. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so now, uh, how much time do we have left? Now I, I see by according to actually. Okay, so what's okay? What's next now? The conclusion of our. We were thinking of uh, doing a wrap up of the whole thing at the next session of the whole book. Is that right? That's good. Would that be good? Yeah. Any ideas how we would do that? We should try and come at it in a totally different way. Let's have <laughs> Dharma do it. Dharma, are you ready to do it? Oh, no, 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 I'm not re really, because I've got, I've got quite a bit of stuff on my plate right now. Getting how, about, how about you, Karen? Hi, ah, yes. Uh, okay, I'll give it a go. <laughs> I, I don't know how to do any of the stuff that you've got on trusted sharing. I don't know how to get there or put things mm -hmm. up there like that. Well, maybe we could just uh, mention a few ideas now and that might help. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, it's interesting to me <coughs> that uh, he ends with a couple of prayers. Uh, and I don't, I wouldn't necessarily suggest like we chart the prayers, but it, uh, it might be interesting to, to go in that direction. Uh, I mean, what's the prayer we're walking away with? Uh, we could do a, an online consensus workshop on what uh, are the implications of this. That could get really confusing. Uh, it can have each person come and uh, share some related resource. I, I don't know, there's four bad ideas.
I own a book called Earth Prayers from Around the World, uh, edited by Elizabeth Roberts and Elias Amadon, and this was published in, let's see, Nineteen ninety one. Mm -hmm. uh, there's three hundred and sixty five prayers, poems, and invocations for honoring the earth, which I've been drawn to in terms of knowing that any group of people who are diverse are liable to be coming from many, many different perspectives. Mm. Yeah. I must confess the question I'm st stuck with out of today's conversation is the one uh, Dharma raised. How does all this cease being simply the possession of some super aware elite? and become a conversation that's widespread and widely participated in and widely acted upon. That's kind of caught me. Karen Snyder, Karen Troxell, she insists that it's very easy to get groups of people started on this. And uh, she insists that uh, <coughs> Two sentences on this dimension and a question like, what's going on in the world that's jarred you recently? Gets this conversation started quite easily. And then her second question then is, and where have you see, seen signs of hope? And then for her, that's, you know, then it's all set up and people are ready to launch into a, a workshop on what can we do? And hmm. She's... Uh, she's pretty well convinced that people are ready to act and it's not, you almost have to be really simple in the method you use because people don't want to be complicated. They just want to figure out something they can take on and get working on. Mm. Anyway, that's a thought. That's great. I mean, I'm really glad all these uh, ideas are flowing. I guess one um, one idea that comes to my mind, uh, maybe a bit half big, but uh, what if we looked at something like what are the learnings we take from 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 this book uh, in the context of how 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 caring for the earth could be something involving masses of people, you know, what learnings does this? Maybe that would be one thing to do. Just just a list of learnings, uh, you know, in terms of what we could do. Actually, you know, Jim, we can't hear you. I said Evelyn is typing notes in the in the chat, and then I said, Evelyn, do you have any thoughts to add into this? Uh. I'm really struggling because our 25-year-old dryer died. <laughs> and I cannot any longer get the fuses to repair the machine here in Taiwan. And I 
don't really want to buy a dryer, but I also know that our what our propensity is when Larry flies in from somewhere and needs to wash his clothes and get them dried and then pack up his stuff and go again. And I, it's not like, you know, we're just sitting around waiting for our clothes to dry. I mean, I can do that because I'm not traveling the next day, but he can't. And so then I'm, I'm really struggling with, well, so in terms of ecology, think about uh, these machines that we've come to depend on and we use without regard for, like the story of stuff, creates more junk and more waste. And yet, uh, I... I, I've only seen one place that has dryers that you could take your clothes to. And most people in Taiwan don't even own dryers. They just wait for their clothes to dry. So I'm, I'm torn as a consumer. Uh, Couldn't you buy Larry a second set of clothes? Uh, in two, Taiwan, two suitcases. Two suitcases. Yeah, I know, but one, he's, the one packed and leave it at home, and the other one he takes, and then when he goes the next. <laughs> okay, like this week he's in Shanghai, and then he will go to Hong Kong, and then he will come back on the 18th, and then we will leave as a family for a one-week trip to Thailand, and in between the 18th and the 20th morning. I have to figure out, are we going to just leave his dirty clothes here or his wet clothes hanging somewhere? I, You know, it's sort of, and do I really want to spend a lot of money buying a dryer? I mean, this is really kind of counterproductive because I, I feel this urge not to respond to that but at the same time i also want to be practical in how and you cannot buy his size clothes here. <laughs> you know so the clothes that he has are the clothes that he has maybe we should have the workshop on uh, creative ideas for how the philbricks don't buy a new dryer I know I hate that idea, but that's what's coming to me. Maybe um, we should visit the thrift store. Larry on this. Sorry, Ellen, what did you say? Maybe we should visit the thrift store and get those clothes for Larry in the mail <sighs> quickly in time. We, we had a similar problem uh, many years ago in the San Francisco house, <clears throat> uh, but it had to do with cars. And so, and so we instituted a rule that you always brought the car back full. You weren't allowed to park the car overnight. So I'm assuming he stays in hotels. Some of these places, you could just say, Larry, you got to come home with clean clothes. I'm not doing it anymore. <laughs> yeah, but to me, uh, this is true. You know, this the sense of being the sense of feeling trapped you know you don't have a choice but you've got to either go that way or put yourself through inconvenience i mean i and i think that's that's the kind of feeling a lot of people have you know they want to do something to get out of it but they can't because they are trapped and uh, actually earlier in the book francis does talk about being caught in the trap of the consumer paradigm and uh, you know the trap is more than just you know, I, I want to go shopping. It is the choices are, are, are created in such a way that that's all you can do. You know, mm. I mean, there were there were times I remember when I was young. If something went wrong, you could open it up and pull out a fuse and go and change that. Today, you got to change the entire thing. You know, the entire component, or probably throw it out, throw it out. So, um, yeah. Anyway, yeah. just point to the whole issue of being trapped in that paradigm. 
And the trap is more than just the mindset. The trap is actually the way the market is structured. And uh, yes. yeah, I think the problem with the dryer is just an evidence of, of, yeah. of that going on in people's lives. Yeah. Well, and well, it's, also, it's also, uh, if you go to the market and you start buying food at the, at the uh, wet market or you go to a place where there's a fresh food and you, and you decide you're not going to buy any instant noodles with prepackaged flavorings and so forth and so on. And then you have to figure out how am I going to store a larger amount of dried noodles or dried rice or dried you know wheat flour or whatever it is you're consuming and you then end up buying other kinds of containers because you don't want to have to use plastic but then after you cook something you still store things in containers which may be glass or maybe plastic and then you end up with this conundrum of, well, if I receive all these little plastic bags, maybe I should just recycle them, which means you're still contributing to the dilemma of using the plastic bags. And so it's, it's a very, it's not an easy answer. No. Does this give Karen enough ideas so she can plan something for next week? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. I need, I need a contemplative rest. <laughs> With my eyes closed. Uh, I'm and, sorry. And, and Karen, Karen, uh, I'm happy if there's any conversation, you know, anything in terms of uh, technological stuff. Uh, right. To help out, just send me an email. We can connect or whatever like that to come up with yeah. something. Yeah, I'll be in touch. I will okay. need it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dharma. This is David. I think we've got to somehow end up answering the question, where, where are you hopeful? Mm. Where are we hopeful? Is that what where you said? Next week, I mean. <laughs> where are we hopeful? Yeah, where are we hopeful? Yeah. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, James. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Evelyn. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.